welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are preserving and teaching them. Well, it's late summer in Norman here. The uh, students and staff are coming back to the university, and folks are coming back from their summer vacation. Uh, to be perfectly honest, we had a different show planned for tonight, which we had to postpone because the guests became ill. But I thought I'd take advantage of this opportunity to welcome back our seasonal Norman residents uh, and any new viewers to the WordPath show. Let me explain what uh, the WordPath show is for those who haven't seen it before, the, the shows, type of shows that we have done and the ones that we have planned for the future. First of all, my name is Alice Anderton, and I'm a linguist. I've specialized in the study of Indian languages for about 25 years now. And WordPath is a weekly program. It airs, uh, as you can see, on Channel 28 in Norman. It shows Monday evenings at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 7 p.m. We have an all-volunteer crew, an excellent bunch of folks. They're mostly Native Americans themselves, the majority are, and mostly of Oklahoma tribal descent, in fact. Let me tell you some of the shows we've done so far. This is our 37th. We've had shows that treated languages including Cherokee, Creek, Comanche, Oto, Chickasaw, Caddo, Kiowa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Seminole, and Choctaw. And we've also had some shows discussing um, topics such as linguistic borrowing, language teaching techniques, uh, greetings in Indian languages, language families, and fundraising for language programs. We plan to do about 40 more programs so that uh, by the end of this show, sometime next year, I hope, we will have done at least one program on each language that's still spoken in Oklahoma. We have an Oklahoma Foundation for the Humanities grant to do uh, 15 programs. We've begun those 15 already. We have about 12 to go on that. And we have another grant from the Endangered Language Fund to do two programs. And some of these future shows will include shows on Caddo, Wyandotte, Seneca, Peoria, Modoc, Miami, Ottawa, Cherokee, Delaware, and Choctaw. And we're also going to have a show on boarding schools, one on archiving and tape preservation and that sort of thing. Another one on the situation of people of multiple heritages. Uh, what can they do about learning their um, language of heritage if they have more than one? There are special problems related to that. We're also going to do two mini-dramas, I hope later this fall, that will be entirely written and acted in Oklahoma Indian languages. So you have that to look forward to. By the way, if there are any of you that would like to volunteer to become part of our crew, you'd be very welcome to. You need to be a Norman resident and 18 years or older. If you're interested, you should call Multimedia at 325-0393. When you call, you need to sign up for the class that trains new community producers. Everyone's required to take that class before they uh, begin to crew on a program. The next one will be held, I believe, September the 11th, but you should call that number to check. Uh, you can meet some interesting people and learn some really neat video skills. WordPath will soon be available to people who don't have cable TV or who live outside of the Norman area. Our Oklahoma Foundation for the Humanities grant uh, has provided some money for tapes for making uh, the show available to libraries in Norman, Oklahoma City, Lawton, and Tulsa. Now, as soon as we get a three-quarter inch playback deck, hint, hint, if anyone has a, a donation they'd like to make, we'd be very happy. As soon as we get this playback tape from which to make the copies, um, these will become available in libraries, and we'll keep you posted on that. Now, WordPath um, tries to educate and entertain the public. But we also have a practical purpose. Very often we spend time trying to share information which, with people who are actually doing language preservation work. Things like uh, information about, um, um, well, about teaching techniques, uh, events that are coming up in the near future, uh, grant opportunities, uh, workshops, and things of that sort. And along the lines um, of being of practical help to Normanites interested in Indian languages, tonight I'd like to especially address the new and returning language students and instructors. I want to encourage you all to make the most of the resources available to you at OU and elsewhere in order to have the best possible language teaching and language learning experience. First of all, students go to class every day. It might seem like a trivial point, but you need to do this. Don't forget how lucky you are to be able to study Indian languages in Norman. It's not just any university that has this to offer, you know. So don't waste the opportunity. Really make, make sure that you make the most of it. By the way, for those of you who may not know, OU offers um, several Oklahoma Indian languages uh, for college credit. 
Uh, they offer Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, and Kiowa classes at three levels, beginning, intermediate, and advanced, all for credit. Uh, and they also fulfill the foreign language requirements at OU. If you're interested in enrolling in any of these, I believe you may be too late for this semester, but for information on future classes, contact the registrar or the anthropology department and they'll be able to tell you what's available. Um, another reason you should go to every class, uh, even more so than with other college classes, is that language cannot be learned entirely from a book or from a tape. Unlike chemistry or math or history, you cannot cram to make up for a class that you happen to have missed. It's as if every class were a lab session and it, you just have to be there and experience it uh, in order to get the material that's covered there. Language is social and it's experiential. You have to be there to get it. So that's my pep talk on not missing any of your classes. Number two, besides going to class every day, be sure to expand your language experience as much as you can so that it's not limited just to the classroom. This can range from very simple things like la labeling items in your home in the language that you're studying so that you can put the word for chair on the chair and uh, the word for coffee on the can of coffee and that sort of thing. Uh, it might sound trivial, but this actually does help to bring the language into your life and it sort of changes your mental attitude in a subconscious way so that it becomes part of what you're living and doing more so than if it were limited just to the classroom itself. Secondly, connect with or form a language community speaking the language that you're studying. Uh, for instance, if you're in a first semester class, introduce yourself to someone who's in a semester ahead of you, a second or third semester class, and do something in the language, maybe a no English allowed lunch once a week or something like that, uh, to get extra practice and to be practicing with somebody who's a little bit ahead of you in their skills. Find a buddy, uh, well, let me, let me go back for a moment, uh, besides getting with someone who's ahead of, a step ahead of you in your language program, um, keep in mind that there are often native language events in your tribe, if you are a member of a tribe, or even if you aren't in the tribe uh, related to the language. And uh, some of these may be available uh, within an accessible distance of Norman. If so if you find a buddy in one of your classes or one of the more advanced classes, maybe you can carpool and go to a powwow or some other event together, uh, especially if it's something where, of course, where the Indian language is being used. Are you a non-Indian studying an Indian language? Find an Indian buddy in one of your classes and go to something together. This will help a non-Indian to get a little bit more of the perspective of a member of the tribe who is trying to preserve or learn their own language. Next, don't forget your own family. Um, those of you who are Indian, a lot of you have grandmas who speak the language and you've never spoken it with them because you didn't know how to. Now that you're learning, try to take advantage of this, this built-in resource in your own family. And while you're at it, you'll make your grandma really happy. So as soon as you know how to say anything, go say it to her or call her up on the phone and say hello in the language. You'll blow her away. <laughs> or him, if it's your grandpa. Um, it'll make her really proud of you. You can also do things like you can buy or make greeting cards with sound chips in them. You can buy these now that you, you buy the card and then you record on it. Or you can even, I think you can go to Radio Shack and get the chips and make your own. So get a greeting card with a sound chip and record something in the Indian language on the card and send that to your relatives for birthdays or Valentines or Christmas. Finally, get involved at the tribal level. Um, are you Indian but a little out of touch with traditional activities? A lot of students are, and um, it's really nothing to be ashamed of. You are where you are in your life. But if you, start, if you can start participating more in cultural or spiritual activities um, as is appropriate to your interests, especially those where the language is still being used, then the language will mean more to you uh, when you're more familiar with the culture that goes with it. Don't be ashamed of what you don't know or haven't done. Just be a student and learn. Go from this step forward. And uh, the best way to do this is to expose yourself to as much of the language and culture together as possible. Does your tribe have a language committee? If so, join it. If not, maybe you will have the time and resources um, to get some people together and begin a language committee. And thirdly, and this is where I have some show and tell for tonight, in addition to these things of always going to class and expanding your language experience and, and enlarging it as much as you can, connect with the broader native language preservation community. You might want to take an introductory course in linguistics. These are available at OU and OSU and uh, probably some other schools around the state. Linguistics can help enrich your study of any language. You also might want to do some background reading and join some organizations related to native language issues. And I have some examples here. Let me start off with what I think is a very good book. Now, 
I mentioned this on an earlier show, but I think it's worth showing again. This is called Flutes of Fire. The author is Leanne Hinton, who is a linguist at Berkeley. She does a lot of consulting with California tribes. And there are a number, she edited the book. She didn't write everything in it. There are a number of interesting articles in here that bring up very similar language issues to what we're facing in Oklahoma. There are a lot of very endangered languages in California as well, belonging to several different language families. And a lot of the same issues apply there. So I have found this to be a very interesting book. It's published by Heyday Books in Berkeley. So you might want to check that out. Um, let me tell you about an organization next called Intertribal Word Path Society. I'm involved in this organization. Uh, in fact, I'm the executive director. And we are dedicated to the pres preservation of Oklahoma Indian languages, including supporting this program as best we can by applying for grants and so forth. Um, we have an address. If we could get the address on the screen for IWS, Intertribal Word Path Society, it's, uh, let me move this so you can read better. It's 1506 Barclay Street in Norman, 73071. Or you can call them between 9 and 5 at 447-6103. We hope to be making, as I said, making these videos of, of these programs available later. And we'll be publishing some brochures on language topics. And we're just about to put out our first issue of a uh, newsletter, which will come out four, quarterly, four times a year. If you'd like to get on our list, please write us at that address, and we'll send you the brochure, and we'll get you on the newsletter list and so forth. By the way, we also need a logo by an Oklahoma Indian artist. If we have any artists watching who can um, donate a logo to us, we will give credit wherever possible uh, for your artwork. Uh, but we need to use this on stationery and business cards and flyers and things like that. So we would welcome any ideas that you might have. Contact us at the same number and address. Another good resource in Norman is the Western History Library. I have a brochure from them here. Uh, and you can get this brochure. Um, you see the Western History, it's Western History Collections, I believe, actually, of the University Libraries at OU. Uh, you can get this brochure if you go over there and visit them. They all, there also is actually an entire book of resources on uh, Indian topics. And they have um, a number of interesting things there. They have a great photo collection. You can very likely find pictures of your ancestors or ancestors of people in the tribe of the language that you're studying. They also have something called the Doris Duke Collection of Oral Histories uh, of Indian People. These are, this was a project. I'm not sure exactly when it was done. It was some time ago. It was organized by the American Indian Institute and the Western History Collections together. And it was an oral history project. The interviewers, I think, or most of them, are Native Americans themselves. And they go out and talk to Indian people in the different tribes who reminisce about their lives. There's not a lot of Indian language in it. It's uh, pretty much all in English, I believe. At least the ones I have listened to are. You can either listen to the tapes or read the written transcript of the tapes. And you can get copies of all of these things for fees from the librarian. Uh, the person to talk to there, the head of the whole shebang, I believe he's the, called a librarian rather than curator, but I may be wrong on that. His name is Donald DeWitt, and uh, uh, you can find his number in the OU directory or um, reach him through the university libraries in the Norman phone book. Next, the Oklahoma State Historical Society. Again, this is more of an English language and cultural and historical background kind of resource. But it, you can find some neat things up there sometimes. The Historical Society is located right next to the state capitol in Oklahoma City on uh, Lincoln Boulevard. I don't have the exact address, but I guess everyone knows where that is, or you can find it in the phone book. Um, they have uh, a number of things. They have roles, tribal roles. They have um, one of the things I found really interesting there is the correspondence, records of the correspondence of Indian agents uh, between Oklahoma, going correspondence between Oklahoma and Washington. Uh, that go back many years to the early, or early days of, um, I think even before the state, the early days of the Indian agent, um, addressing issues that come up. A lot of times linguistic and cultural issues. I remember reading someone that was writing about some Ponca people. They wanted permission to hold a, dress, uh, to hold a, a certain kind of dance on the 4th of July. And so a letter had to be written to the secretary back in Washington. Could they have permission to do this? And the answer, as I recall, came back to the effect that, well, yes, they could as long as no children were around. I thought that was so telling, because it showed that there was a very deliberate attempt to put an end to culture at that current generation. Language and culture, the same thing was going on with language and culture. And people in the government, in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, were extremely aware 
that it's the youth, youth that are the future of maintaining your language and your culture. And they wanted, to, they wanted to have a heart where it came to the old folks who wanted to dance traditionally, but they wanted to make sure that this stuff didn't continue. So they said, yeah, it'd be okay if only the older people were there and none of the children. They really were trying to nip all of this in the bud. It was very sad to read, but you can find very interesting evidence of governmental attitudes there, among other things. Um, another good resource is another organization called the Oklahoma uh, Native Language Association, and we have an address up there for that. Good. They put out a, uh, a newsletter also. They, this is only the second, I believe, the second issue. Uh, but this is an organization of people involved, uh, mostly Native people involved in preserving teaching and learning their Oklahoma Native languages. Uh, they put out the newsletter and sponsor workshops to teach linguistics to Native people. And there's a Preston conference coming up October 2nd to 4th. It's in uh, Preston, Oklahoma, in uh, east, eastern Oklahoma. Um, and if you'd like more information, I would suggest that you write to ONLA. Uh, the address is gone from the screen now, but the person, the president of the association is Greg Bigler. He's a Yuchi man. And his phone number is 918 227 0659. We're also putting up some email addresses tonight, by the way, where we have them, but we had a problem with the uh, computer-generated uh, titles. We couldn't get the at sign, which is in all of these addresses, so we've used the crosshatch symbol instead. When you see that in an, in an electronic address, just substitute the at sign. So his email is gdbigler at gorilla.net. This is a very useful organization, which I recommend to you. Another good organization is EPOLA. Uh, I want to hold up this brochure because I've just got a Xerox. It's not a very good one to show. But EPOLA stands for the Institute for the Preservation of the Original Languages of the Americas. And it's located uh, at 713 and one half A Canyon Road in Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87501. Their email is epola at roadrunner.com. And their phone number is 505. 820-0311. What else do we have? Um, I think I've got two more to show. Um, the next one I think I'll show you is this very nice magazine. It's, uh, I guess I would call it a magazine. This is the summer 1997 issue. I think this, I was trying to remember how often it comes out. I guess it must be quarterly. This is called News from Native California. I've been subscribing to this for some time. Now, I do um, specialize in Oklahoma Indian languages since I live in Oklahoma, but I used to live in California, so I know some of the people involved in the efforts out there. And as I was saying before, so many of the issues are the same, and the situation of so many of the languages there is quite similar to what's going on in Oklahoma. This is a very good publication. There is, uh, by the way, um, in each issue, there's a language column authored by Leanne Hinton. She's the Berkeley linguist that I mentioned before that wrote Flutes of Fire. Um, so there are language issues discussed in a way that's very appropriate to native language issues. And there are a lot of other good um, art articles and historical and cultural articles. I find it to be a very good publication. Now let me show you uh, one more thing and then mention two more. Two more. Well, I've got two more to show. Um, this, is, um, this is the newsletter from an organization called the Society for the Study of the Indigenous Languages of the Americas. I believe we have an address for them. There we go. Uh, this is published in California. Um, and this is sometimes called SILA for short, Society for the Study of the Indigenous Languages of the America, Americas. This is a very useful newsletter. Comes out, uh, gee, I guess monthly? This is July 1997. I'm not sure it comes out monthly. I don't think it comes out that often. But this is uh, the most recent one which happens to include an article about the Intertribal Word Path Society and the Word Path Show, mostly about the Word Path Show. There's also an article in here. You find the most interesting things in here about Indian languages around the country and also actually um, other native um, languages of the Americas. There's an article in here about the word squaw. Now, I have heard some of, uh, some of what's reported here that squaw is supposed to, have been supposed to have been based on an Algonquian term which was an insulting uh, sexual term for women. And there's a linguist here, um, Goddard, 
who Ives Goddard, uh, who works at the Smithsonian, I believe, there's an article that, that references his work uh, trying to trace the actual origin of the word squaw, and he finds out that actually it's based on, I believe it was a Mohawk word for woman, which is not at all disrespectful. It's a perfectly normal, respectful word. I think it's fair to say that when the word squaw is used in English, it's generally not respectful, but it's good to have uh, the actual true history, linguistic history of things explicated by scholarly people who really know what they're talking about. It just makes very interesting reading. Each issue includes a media watch, so you can tell what movies are coming out in what languages. And, and uh, I remember when Dances with Wolves came out, there was some discussion about Doris Liedercharge, who had trained the people to speak Lakota, the actors to speak Lakota. Uh, most of them were not native speakers of Lakota, but they had extensive training, and I thought it came off pretty well. So all sorts of just interesting background on things like this, including information on laws that are up before the legislature. I just really heartily recommend that you subscribe to this. It's, I believe, twelve fifty a year to join the organization, and another $3 if you want the directory of people that are members, which can be very useful, and you get the newsletter when you join. Finally, next to finally, I wanted to mention an upcoming conference. This is called Stabilizing Indigenous Languages. This will be, I believe, the fifth annual, fifth annual conference on stabilizing indigenous languages. It's going to be held this year in Louisville, Kentucky. And we have the address on the screen. In case that went by too quickly, I'll read it to you. You should write Dr. Robert St. Clair, Department of English, University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, 40292. This is going to be held May 14th to 16th, 1998. I went to the one this past year in Flagstaff and it was an excellent conference. It wasn't one of these super scholarly academic conferences with a lot of uh, linguists and anthropologists who aren't Indian and spend most of their time in the ivory tower. This is mostly native people who are teaching uh, their languages or developing materials and so forth, talking about their own experiences from their own point of view. I found it really, really inspirational and helpful to me. Finally, there's one more organization of special interest to Oklahoma people. It's called the Oklahoma Intertribal Cultural Preservation Society. I know three of the people involved in this, Tanona Kuhn, who's Wyandotte, Jennifer Macasia, who's Absentee Shawnee, and Marianne Long, who I believe she's not Indian, but she works for the Iowa tribe. And this is primarily a cultural preservation society, but you will find, since language and culture go so much together, I think you'll find it of interest if you're interested in Indian languages as well. So, we've given you a lot of uh, names and addresses and telephone numbers. If any of them went by too quickly and you're watching the show on a Monday, watch for it on Friday and you can get a second chance or you can get in touch with us at the Intertribal WordPath Society address, which will be given again at the end of the program. What I would really like everybody to do is just take advantage of every resource that there is in the classroom, outside of the classroom, nationally, statewide, regionally. Get every kind of input you can to enrich your language learning experience. It really will add to it, make it more rounded, uh, help you to understand how, how the language actually works. And get inspired. <laughs> Let's build stronger language communities um, and integrate the analytical, uh, if that's your bag, um, with the experiential. I really do believe very strongly that language is primarily experiential. But it can be fun, if, for those of us like me, linguists and other um, <clears throat> language structure fans, it can be a lot of fun to sort of see in a sort of more abstract way how a language works and work up rules and study it in that kind of way. <coughs> Excuse me. If that's not your bag, go more with the organizational involvement and talk with other people who are working on either the same language that you're studying or studying the same language or teaching it or uh, people who are doing something similar in other tribes. It is amazing. I've talked to people at conferences and in schools uh, on the East Coast to the West Coast and in Oklahoma, and you would just be amazed how much the issues are the same all over this nation. Dozens and dozens of languages are in just the same shape, believe me, as the language that you are studying. So I think we can all take inspiration from each other and encouragement. And it really is very, very practical not to be reinventing the wheel. Perhaps you are an instructor who's running a language class. I really recommend that you network with other instructors and students as much as possible. It'll help you come up with better ideas uh, for teaching your class. And the same with students. Tips about how to, how to be a better student uh, and kinds of things that you might want to do with the knowledge once you get it, starting a language committee and making a videotape 
um, saving things on tape or in writing, uh, encouraging people to write their reminiscences in their language. It's just there's so much that can be done. And if you are inspired and enthused and you're learning um, a new language and would like to get involved beyond the walls of the classroom, there are plenty of opportunities. And your involvement will help other people with theirs, too. We can all inspire each other, I think. So everybody gets get inspired. Let's build stronger language communities and integrate the, these languages into our lives more. It'll benefit everyone who's trying to learn. So OE students and individual students and teachers working on your own, best of luck in your language studies. And join us next time on WordPath. <laughs> Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gwana kita, wa pene ma na ole kita.